Troy Coco, Musicians in Bars Getting Beer. Hi, Troy. Hi. Tell us about Jim Cuddy. Jim Cuddy. Jim Cuddy was born of a, of a very hot July day. I was uh, doing some work around the house, and uh, I hadn't written a song. I'm a songwriter primarily. That's sort of my bread and butter, I would say. I produce as well. And, uh, and I wasn't able to songwrite for about two weeks. I was going a little crazy. Uh, man, I really... Maybe if I could write a song in my head. So I was just coming up with stuff. And so I read probably two or three songs that that in that two-week span that were... And I would basically just come up with melodies. And then and then once I had a line, I'd like write a line down. So Jim Cuddy was written while I was drywalling, I think, in Calgary. So, <laughs> And to be really honest, because I write in the country... Uh, world and commercial country there's no there's you know it's it's one of those genres where right now it's a lot of rap and and it's uh, it's really fused with pop r&b hip-hop in a, in a big way right now and so that song uh was really just for me and for me to uh you know play at writers rounds when we are um you know uh doing our thing and so ultimately that uh, the tune ended up uh, on my record and so i thought that would be a really great way to to uh, pay homage to such a great canadian icon and um and uh, so ultimately what i ended up doing was engaging uh some animators and i was looking locally yeah. trying to find somebody that was could do would be willing to to do the work, but also too, because I already had a storyboard and a storyline all worked out for the, sure. for the thing. And I uh, came across a guy named Reggie Entienza who used to work with Hanna-Barbera on okay. Scooby-Doo. Really? Yeah. So that was, that was real uh, cool. And so it does I, look Scooby-Doo-esque. Right. And so, uh, the, the Scooby-Doo angle I thought was great because, you know, I was really trying to go for a blue rodeo circa 1990 sound. I had mm -hmm. the, uh, I had a fellow named Mike Little, who was a George Canyon's music director, who, who was a great keyboard player, and he actually had the Ace Tone, which was the Ace Tone was actually one of the original keyboards that Blue Rodeo used to use, apparently. So he actually used it on the on the track, and so I thought it would be cool to have this the circa 1990 song with a little bit old school uh, animation on it, and. So that was my that was sort of my vision going forward, and and to be really honest, I wasn't really sure: am I going to release this thing? Am I going to am I going to just soft release it to the world, or am I going to chase it? And so, um, but uh, I just thought, you know, give it as much legs as we can, and, and share it with the world, and and uh, especially with Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Toronto is uh, is really the music center for me. It's the music center of our of our great nation, and and so there's a lot of um, I think a lot of Jim Cuddy fans and Blue Rodeo fans here that I think they could appreciate it. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's a funny song. <laughs> and so, what what's the tale? In two thousand seven, we got our we had our first time we were ever nominated for Songwriter of the Year at the Canadian Country Music Awards, and we were just pumped. And one of the other people in our in our category was Jim Cuddy because he had released a, a, a really great song of his. Um, and so we we were in the in the. In Do you a remember group. what you were up against at the time? That that one was to pull me through. Okay. Yeah, and and, and I'll tell you, he played that on stage, just him and a piano, and it absolutely slayed oh, the sure. slayed the audience, and it was just like wow. So, but so, we we got to meet but him. You at, won anyway. Yep. You know, no, we did not. Oh. <laughs> we, we, we were both. <laughs> you know, we lost together. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so we could do a whole interview <laughs> just quoting <laughs> yeah, their lines, just quoting yeah, yeah, Blue Rodeo uh, lyrics. But we got to meet him, and I remember seeing. Oh, him, that's wonderful. Yeah, and I, I remember seeing a picture afterwards with my wife and Jim Cuddy, and I was like, man, you know, she doesn't look at me like that. <laughs> they make a nice. <laughs> she couple, doesn't do smile. They? <laughs> yeah, she doesn't smile at me. But you know, he's such a he's such a gracious guy. Um, and just really kind to everybody. He you just got to let her go. Yeah, it's like you know, I oh, can't well, compete Jim with Cuddy. that. So the the song sort of pokes fun at that, and yeah. and uh, you know because I think he's you know he's he's talented and humble and you know like uh, many Canadian uh, great Canadian artists and yeah. and a legend and so yeah. you know it's it's really just fun poking at that that you know every guy in the world's probably like oh my God Jim Cuddy I cannot compete yeah <laughs> I can't get, I anybody can't who compete. has a, an acoustic guitar anyway oh for sure you know and he's uh, he's got that smile and the voice and yeah, uh, yeah. so voice. he's incredible oh, yeah. yeah.
No. Got a great wife there, obviously. Yeah, she songwrites as well. She's okay. actually in Nashville right now. Oh. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we uh, broke into the country music world back in 2007 uh, when, we, when we met Jim for the first time. And, and, uh, but we, have, uh, we, we, we lead a really sort of odd musical life because we've always, up until the last little while, we've always been sort of like, well, well the music is sort of something we do. Um, and who knows what's going to happen with it because, you know, I got into music late, uh, you know, and so I was, I didn't, I wouldn't say I never really took it seriously, but I just didn't know would it, would music take me very seriously, <laughs> you know, I'm not a super serious guy. Yeah. And um, so I just thought, you know, what we'll do is we're going to work hard, be kind to people and try to do the best we can and learn and have fun. And so that really has been the core value of, of how we do things. And um, so far, it's been great. You know, we, it's, it's, it's been a very slow, I always tell people, the, you know, breaking into the music business is like growing an apple tree. It's boring and anticlimactic. And by the time it's done, you're just, yeah. It's that's, just apples. It's that. <laughs> is the rest of your writing on the same lines in, in terms of lightness, comedy, or do you have like romantic country songs or heartbreak songs that, what do you, what else you know, do you do? So the rest of the record and with your wife too. If yeah, you absolutely. Tie it all in. With with the rest of the record, I can honestly say for me personally, uh, I am always the kind of person I'm sort of half and half. Uh, my uh, the my next this the C D that I'm putting out, this body of work, Jim Cuddy's sort of the only, you know, buddy type song. Right. I tend to write a lot of them because I'm a bit of a goof. I collect comic books mm -hmm. and I don't take myself or the business or really anything that seriously. So I, I like to poke fun at myself and everything else. Um, but I would have to say that the bulk of the work in there has been, it's, it's, I think, you know, when you, if you know anybody that's, you know, tries to be funny or is in the comedy comedy business, they usually have a pretty heavy, <laughs> pretty heavy heart. So I would have to say that I'm somewhat in the same camp. I'm you know pretty sensitive kind of guy and so uh, I think some of the songs uh, are are pretty they're they're very revealing and they're about my personal life and mm -hmm. and uh, but I think there is a levity to everything on the record and, and basically there is a there is a, overall there's a, a, a lightness to it mm -hmm. I would have to say I, I kept it um, I kept it real and I have found for myself that when I'm singing about things that really mean something to me or the actual details from my real life or how I'm really feeling, uh, usually people are like, wow, you know, and, and that's something even with the funny songs, you know, sure. I, when I first got into the business, I was like, okay, we're going to write a country song and I would listen to the chart topping songs and I would try to write them. And the more I did it, you know, the worse I got. <laughs> and um, what I realized is that I'm trying to be something that I'm not. You know, I'm trying to create something that is not genuine inside of me and that does nothing to do with who I am as a person or things that I believe in. And it doesn't mean that they're bad or good. It's Completely just... Completely different presentation Yeah, layer. and that it's not coming from an honest place. Sure. And, it, and when it's... We all and when experience the, that in this business. Yeah, and when the music's not coming from an honest place, it's actually audible. Your general persona is that thing that... Yeah. You're, yeah, you can either be the presentation layer, which is not real. Mm-hmm superficial yeah. thing i find it to be a uh, very ego driven um Absolutely. you know we've got to be uh at the very front forefront and we have to be relevant and we have to be um you know at the at the cutting edge of the you know as opposed to you know what i value more now having been in the business for the last little while has been really trying to find the best version of myself in the creative process, you know, and, and trying to say something that's real because most yeah. of the time, even the, the Jim Cuddy thing, you know, for my own purposes, it's like, it's about me. Like, Oh my God, I'm so inadequate. Yeah, what's that feeling? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think some people can relate to that. So I actually recorded in a, a home studio that I built last year. Um, you know, we, we uh, produce and write with country artists. And so, a big part of our plan moving forward was to uh, build the studio yeah. and uh, it wasn't fun at all because it was uh, an incredibly huge amount of work sure. uh, but the, the the side benefit of that is now I'm in a position as a, as a writer and as a producer and even as an artist that I can like with this project that is coming out in February 
and this Jim Cuddy song, I was able to, you know, I, we wrote it, uh, recorded it, I mixed it and mastered it, prepared it for streaming platforms. So the great part about all of this is that I was able to do all of this with sort of nobody's help. Right. And which is, you know, I, I respect all mixing uh, uh, mixers and the engineering folks that we 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 have worked with and, and that still do work with. But I think for myself, I realized that in order for me to uh, keep craft dinner on my table mm -hmm. and to continue to create and to attract artists to us, that we have to be very agile and have the ability to uh, turn around things quickly uh, with quality as well. And so that this is part of that whole process for me making this project uh, uh you know sort of the sinister left-handed side of me was doing it so that i have a, a a platform on which to you know sort of launch uh the studio and so that's been uh, really a, a big part of it and, and the studio itself is very new so we as, as songwriters we've worked with uh well probably the most recent uh famous person would be brett kissel so we had a cut on his record and we've worked with uh, a few other artists in Canada. The, the, our first cut was with a fellow named Shane Yellowbird, which was a um, on ramp, which is now Louis O'Reilly, who owns that business, is now with Invictus, uh, which is Brett's management company. Cool. They have George Canyon and Aaron Prechette and a few other artists like that. And uh, yeah, so we've had uh, you know a few of those people on the songwriting side, and then on the uh, production side, uh, my first sort of baby project that I produced was a, a young fellow with Invictus. Uh, his name is Beamer Wiggly and I uh, got to co-produce uh, my first project there and, and but it was on the heels of me just building the studio and so here's me like you know plugging stuff together and like <laughs> oh my gosh you know and so it was a great learning experience and the cool thing about you know the music business once you develop relationships and get to meet people say hey you know what are you what are you doing in the next you know couple of weeks can you work with this guy and you know we're trying to we're trying to get this this song this project out to radio and so i had a so our first single with beamer was on i think it was on ytv and stations all across the country oh, and so it's, yeah it was great and so it's a really for you know for us in canada we're so lucky because we've got the 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 can con Canadian content rules that that sort of force the broadcasters to, to support the Canadian talent yeah. because of that we've been able to I've been able to learn how to songwrite I've been able to learn how to produce and, and it's given me the wheels to to grow a business that really for me in any other environment I probably had no <laughs> business it's, you know it would have been really difficult uh, but you know we're so lucky I, I know uh, artists in the states and managers and labels and man they, they come out the minute they walk out the door they are uh going toe-to-toe -to -toe with tim mcgraw or or luke bryan or they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with um you know bruno mars and and it's rough man like yeah. you've, you've got to be it's you know you spend 10 to 12 to 15 years developing your skills and then once you get there if you're lucky and you get a good break it's like you 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 can eat <laughs> you know <laughs> So it's uh, you know we're we're very fortunate and I'm very very always very grateful to to uh, build a business here and uh, be involved in in the in the industry here. So you mentioned off camera uh, one of your fortes in in uh, developing your business was uh, the forms filling out the forms. Yeah, uh, I think that's a. Uh, and actually, you did the the management course here. Or yeah, the art, yeah, it's the art, the. You want to talk a bit about yeah, that? Yeah. Canada's mu Music Incubator, which a coalition runs out of this business, uh, out of this building here in, in, in Scarborough. Uh, they, they basically uh, have, co they coach artist managers and uh, artists. And I think what that came from was uh, people in the business noticed all of a sudden because the money depleted. And all of a sudden the managers are only going after the people that the, sh the, the sure things. And so there was no development going on. So what uh, they've done uh, in coordination with a few agencies is that they've basically injected some time and effort and money into developing and helping uh, nurture uh, artist managers and, and also helping the artists themselves get a little more business savvy. Um, so for us, you know, we, when we went through this program, um, for myself, when I went through the program, you know, we talked about legal stuff we talked about insurance we talked about um you know partnerships 
contracts, you know, all of these things that are critical in business decision, in, in making business decisions properly. So, Absolutely. really, really great. And so that's uh, only one of the things they do here, though. Yeah, and it's, it, and it only, you know, like the, the Coalition Music, of course, they, they, they launched uh, so many great acts. Uh, and, and they've got uh, Scott Hellman, and they've got uh, Our Lady Peace. And simple plan they have all these huge yeah. international acts and so but they I believe what they're doing is they're giving back to the community the music community that they have um, uh, benefited from for so many years and they're giving back and, and you know Rob and Eric the guys that own own the business and they are um, that's who they are you know very rare in this business to to find someone at a, at a high level that is um, has a bit of uh, big picture thinking, but uh, you know, Coalition Music, uh, Canada's Music Incubator, that's what they're all about. So it's, it's, it was really, I benefited greatly from that. Not only for the Jim Cuddy song and for this, you know, cause I am now able to take this, you know, I had a plan. Uh, I was able to formulate a plan with this song. I was able to formulate a plan with the release. Uh, and which was great because I would have really just been guessing. But at least at uh, you know uh, at this point I have I'm able to come up with some plans and think about well who, how am I going to who am I going to engage on the on the uh, media side and who am I going to engage on the radio side and how do I have to make this plan work so that it's going to at least pay for itself and I'm not going to be <clears throat> you know in debt after yeah, yeah. let's give yeah. us some backstory on the whole animation thing sure yeah um, so the animation itself. I think for myself, because because I wrote this song that was sort of silly, I felt like it really needed something that was going to be fun, uh, and and I don't know really if it's a if it's just a because the song was about Jim Cuddy, I definitely didn't want my face, <laughs> my actual face in the video. So I thought animation made sense, and I used to cartoon when I was in college. I used to do panel cartoons. And I thought, oh, I'll do a stop motion. That'll be great. I love stop motion. I'm going to do it. So I, you know, I have, I have some friends in animation that I know. And, and about three to four months before the song was about to be released, I'm like, wow, i got to do the stop motion animation. And I started calculated the, like, you know, 24 frames a second. So three minutes. And blah, blah, blah. It's like 45,000 shots I had to take. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, this is too much. So I combed the internet and I wanted to find a really great animator. And I ended up finding a guy named Reggie Entienza, who used to work at Hanna-Barbera doing Scooby-Doo cartoons. Okay. And because I had all the storyboard and the storylines all laid out, it was easy for him to walk in and he could draw what he needed to draw relatively quickly. But the cool thing was he threw in some little pro Hanna-Barbera tricks from his 30 years of doing film, animated film. And so I was just elated so how, that, how does that all tie together? well yeah so uh so i used to panel cartoon myself and i do know animators through i write children's songs as well the only job that matches my maturity level and um and so but those animators some of those animators are you know they're they're very very busy people and of course animation is like oh my gosh it's a hugely time consuming yeah. if you've got a job in animation you have it's you have no time for anything else so mm -hmm. I decided I was going to have to hire somebody, and so I, I started to reach out to other uh, to people in, in the you know looking for animators, right. you know cartoon animators, and it was it was it was a daunting task because now I'm trying to look for something that's like I don't want it to be you know too quirky, but I want it to be kind of you know cartoonish. I didn't know what I was looking for, and then I got uh, I reached out to this one fellow. And I didn't, I loved the artwork, but I didn't know who he was. And then when I looked on, uh, it went Reggie Entienza. That's his name. That? And uh, I, I looked him up at INDB. It's like Scooby-Doo. I'm like, whoa, no wonder I love this stuff. Uh -huh. And I thought that the Scooby-Doo angle with the song, uh, because it's about Jim Cuddy. And I thought that, to me, I felt that the, the Scooby-Doo animation would really appeal to the demographic too the people that i thought would maybe dig the song would probably dig the animation because it had some yeah, brilliant you know so uh it was great and and reggie himself incredibly humble like every 
uber talented person you ever meet. They're insanely ta uh, uh, talented, but ultimately very humble guy. And uh, yeah, so he was great and super great to work with. So, so tell us about tell us more about the night uh, that you met Jim. So it was it would have been September '07. Uh, we met. Uh, we we were nominated for Songwriter of the Year. We knew we weren't going to win because we were brand new. And if you know anything about award shows and award bodies, they are based on votes from your other peers. And if they no one knows you, you don't get any votes. Mm -hmm. So you, we got in because we had we had a cut with a Universal Music artist. So I think Universal Music wanted the FaceTime for the artist, but they we knew we weren't going to get in. Fine. One of the other nominees was Jim Cuddy. So, and I, the, uh, one of the first songs I played live was Try. Um, and so I was just like, man, like, this is amazing. And mm -hmm. so we met him, super kind. Uh, absolutely, the, one of the most humble, um, you, sometimes you meet people that are u uber famous and they're just like, oh my gosh, like, please, yeah. you know, they'll pose for a picture, but they're just, they're, they're, completely over the being famous you know but and then i think with jim cuddy because so many people are so because his music is amazing yeah and he makes such an incredible impact on people yeah he's in everybody it kind of shocked me how how kind he was and generous yeah. with his time so anyway so we met him that's, and we took some took, took some pictures with him and so he was just a great guy and what was your song that was uh our song, uh, it was it's a it was a song that we had with an artist named Shane Yellowbird, uh, and the song was called Pickup Truck. It's like we got to really dig deep in these country music title, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we had uh, we had some really great uh, success with that. We were so grateful, and we uh, actually Billboard magazine uh, this year listed it all time as like I think it was number six. Wow. Uh, country songs uh, since the charts ever started so we were just like wow, wow. you know Great. we felt so uh, we didn't even know that so it was like kind of a fortunate thing so any other uh, work that you're very proud of that's I mean that definitely was our our, our, our biggest uh, that actually kicked off everything and so you know we've uh, I would have to say you know when I think about the work that so the, my wife writes as well and uh, she had a uh, she had a song that she uh, uh, had cut with a, a band in BC. It's called the Higgins. Really, really great band. And uh, we ended up becoming friends with the people and went out there and wrote, wrote some songs. And so the song the song was called Secondhand Car, and it did real well on radio. And, and you know, I think for me, um, I don't I don't think I, I attach much as much value to this song. And to the success from the song, although it's cool, you know, it's a nice thing to talk about on Facebook. Um, but I think for me, what I really value and what I really get the biggest kick out of is the creative process and the people, you know, because to me, uh, without that, it's it's sort of <laughs> kind of meaningless, you know. I it's... second that emotion. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, well, that's cool. What's your uh, what's your wife's band, or is it? It's just yeah, she's Joni Delorier, and so okay. yeah, and we. Um, it's great. You know, the cool thing about working out in Calgary is that we, we, we have uh, the, the group of people there, the musicians and the artists that are out there. Like J.J. Shiplett is an artist that is, you know, he's Johnny Reed signed him to his label now and he opened for Johnny Reed across Canada. And so well, we've known J.J. for years and he actually sang on Joni's thing, but uh, Joni's CD, recent CD. And, uh, but the, the great thing about Calgary is that we, the, the, you know, we're, we are very close with all of the people that are in the, in the city. So when anybody has any success or is, uh, is doing real well, and one, of our, one of our great uh, you know, mixing buddies, uh, Spencer Cheen, uh, worked on Jocelyn and Alice's um, last two singles. And so it's, just, it's awesome to see the community grow because it attracts more people there and uh, allows for other people to have some success, which is awesome. Do you want to tell us more about your wife's new CD. For sure. Yeah, so my wife is like uber talented. Um, there we go. Yes, my wife's you can amazing. Say hi, but... Yeah. Sorry, Joni. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we actually had, uh, and that was one of the projects that, uh, one of the first projects that I, that I decided I was going to produce and along with her. So we produced it together and I 
uh, it was uh, all of the time. Every time we we've done anything musical, uh, like with with Joni's project, uh, and that was we finished it in 2013. We had JJ sing on it and um, JJ Shiplet. And it was an opportunity for us to get her songs recorded. And those were songs, of course, because I told you before, Billy, that we, we write with country music artists. And a lot, of, a lot of the songs we write really aren't going to work on the genre. So we, we end up cutting our own records to, to promote ourselves as writers. And so, but the record of hers is uh, Joni Deloria, Heart Like This. And, um, but yeah, we released that in, in 2013. And the first two records we did were largely as a vehicle to promote ourselves, but then also too, so if someone's typing, types in our name, it's not just, you know, my ugly mug in a, on, a, on a website. It's, there's something there that someone can go listen to to like, oh, what's this guy about, you know? And so ultimately, um, yeah, but we're actually gonna be working on her second project coming in 2018, so, which is really uh, exciting. Any secrets? Any secrets? The secret I can tell you is that my wife was writing it at Sony ATV in Nashville yesterday. And I and she wrote a song. I can't play it for you. I would love to play it for you. I'll play it for you later when that's off. Well, we can always um, include the link after. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's I am together. certain that this song is going to be a, a, a smash somewhere. Oh, great. Yeah, it, it, it's probably one of the few times that, and you know, it's not that I'm unemotional, but... I've heard quite a few songs, but it's probably one of the first times I've listened to a song and started crying. Um, so I and I texted her right away, and I'm like, absolutely amazing. So, uh, yeah. So there's that. Um, we also have a friend, friend that we have worked with for many years that uh, has been signed to a big publishing deal and also a big uh, uh, artist label, U.S. label deal. And so, um, you know, we, we have those relationships and those relationships are built when those artists, when no one cares. You know, I always tell new, a new songwriters and new artists, it's like, you know, don't try to go to a big label or don't try to go to work with a big artist, work with the people around you. We so underestimate the, our peers in that, you know, in, in five years, you know, that kid that is, you know, slugging it away in every bar in, in Christendom is going to be signed to a label at one point, so... You know, you really need to make your friends. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it in the family. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Any uh, any funny stories from the road? Funny stories for the road. Okay, well, I'll tell you a sort of... Uh, yeah, okay. Here's a funny story from the road. We were uh, touring with Emerson Drive. Now, it was kind of at a time when Emerson Drive had some real big success with DreamWorks in 20, 2002, before I was even writing any songs. Music industry was starting to, to collapse a little bit, and Emerson was re-jigging their, their thing. And we got to go on a tour with them across Canada in their bus. Now, because the, you know, the, the, the money wasn't quite there, so the bus was a little, eh, you know, not, uh, you know, it was good, but, you know, it was like, it was definitely uh, seen today, because they were doing 200 dates a year. What was your band at the time? That was when I was working with Shane Yellowbird. So Shane was the guy that we had the big success with, and so I was playing guitar and singing background vocals, opening for this this label, you know, act, Emerson Drive. And so we were, they said, hey, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have to put you on the bus uh, for a leg of the tour because I was driving myself and Shane. I was the road manager and the merch guy and the <laughs> side guy and the everything guy, and so. We got in. We got in this bus, and the um, the furnace was broke on the bus, so we had to sleep, and we were sleeping in the lounge. And so, if, if any, anybody knows, I've been in a, in a tour bus. There's sort of like the front part, which kind of looks like an RV, and then there's a toilet, which you never use if you're ever on a tour bus toilet. Don't use it. And then there's bunks, and then there's in the back is a little living room. And so we and there, but it was cold. It was like February, and it was like minus. 14, 16, you know, it was like not freezing, but I mean, it was freezing, but it wasn't like, you know, it was still cold. So we're sleeping in the back of this thing and they brought little heaters plugged into the thing so that we could, you know, mm -hmm. anyways, so we're sleeping in the back. Now we're going from Sudbury to Winnipeg and we are in the middle of nowhere, man. And it's probably two in the morning. Somehow I got to sleep after our hyperthermia started to set in, in the back. And all of a sudden, 
the bus stopped. Everybody get off the bus, get off the bus. And I could see sparks coming out of the furnace, landing on me, and it smoke, and I'm like, the first thing in my mind is like, you know, 10, you know, musicians on the side of the road, we're going to die Whoa. out in the Canadian Shield, because no, no one's going to stop. Wow. Yeah. So we get out of the bus. I think I had my pajamas on, my Converse, and I brought my blanket. Anyways, we get back on. They fixed it. They fixed the... I well, didn't fix it. They just basically extinguished the fire <laughs> and uh, got us back on. And so later, because uh, I'm Métis and, and Shane is, is North American native from from uh, um, Hobima, Pinoca, Alberta. And they said, uh, they joked after, they said, leave it to two Indians to start a bus, to start a fire in the back of a bus to keep warm. That was the big joke. So I'm like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. So, anyway. Okay. Well, you've. Uh, I mean, that's a that's a wonderful story. Funny as it is, <laughs> you almost died on a bus in the Canadian Shield. As funny as that is, I'd like to now go into the more serious side of what you just said, which is your Métis. Yeah. Which is wonderful. Tell us, tell us about your heritage. Yeah. What's, so my. What's well, your name? And then people say, what, "What's your heritage?" And I'm like, "Real Canadian. I'm a mutt." So my my dad is Slovenian, which used to be Yugoslavia. But we think he's Serbian because we think his grandma fooled around. Anyways, we won't. This is the farming community that emigrated to the to Western Canada. Yeah, like so, Slovenia Slovenians are like the, the they're hardcore man. Like those guys, like they, you know, they were and primitive because the, there was a communist country, and so they uh, when when they had to farm stuff, it's like they were doing it with friggin' picks and you know, <laughs> like they were nowhere near the where Canada was. So my father emigrated here. And you met my mom. My mom is uh, April Yi. Last, so half Chinese, half Métis. So, oh, yeah. yeah, so she is, uh, and it's Manitoba Métis. So uh, her mother is a flurry. So she was, uh, so it was, uh, yeah, crazy. So my, um, my... Uh, Any relation to the hockey flurries? I think we have like a, the, yeah, Theron flurry. I think there's, you know, someone claims <laughs> that there's like a, you know, six cousin, twin, you know, we're all. Oh, sure. We're all related. No, it's a um, little more so when you get the same name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. It's probably sure. plausible that we're related. So, well, but uh, not uh, to get too into hockey, but that's, <laughs> I could go yeah, on and on. Yeah, no, they there are people in our family that claim we're related, but I'll, you know, it's whatever. I I still uh, so this is your mom's side, which is mm -hmm. half Chinese, half Cantonese, Maybe. half half uh, Metis. Okay, yeah, so they had a the stories, Billy, I could I could go on. The stories that my mom has uh, from her uh, uh, childhood was unbelievable. But um, uh, they uh, uh, largely the the well the two her parents were children of kids from residential schools, so there was a it was a you know like a not a husband and wife but a boyfriend girlfriend runaways from a residential school, and so they were living like out in the boonies because they were fearful of being caught and so they um yeah they raised these kids out in the out in the rocky mountain hills and wow. so it was a pretty hard life i think they um you know and the sad thing about the you know the um the uh, their lives is that of course as many people are aware of in, in canada so many of the our aboriginal first nations people have uh have struggle with addictions and and so our family is the same. We we have the same same things happening. So it's interesting. I'm you know especially more brought to light since uh, Gorda's passed. But mm -hmm. their secret path. Yeah. And so there's a connection there. And, yeah. And that's very relevant today. Yeah. I think, did you want to wrap up by saying anything in particular? Should we find you online? Yeah. If you want to find me online, I, I'm at uh, troycocal.com. And uh, yeah, I had such a great time meeting you, and thank you so much. And, oh. Thank you, Toronto. Uh, I love it here. It's, a, it's such a great city, and, and uh, it's um, for me coming from Calgary to come to Toronto. All of our uh, all of our music business uh, is is here, and so it's uh, I'm always so so excited to come here and, and to connect. So Toronto is meeting place. Yeah. What's you know. What's Calgary mean? I have no idea. <laughs> Actually, I think Calgary knowledge. is like a Scottish name. Oh, okay. Yeah, I believe it is. It's a Scottish thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Are you from downtown Calgary? I kind live. Of that. Yeah, like I live sort of north of downtown Cal Calgary. Honestly, has been so good to us. Uh, 
even though the music community is growing, it still has a long ways to go. But because of the, uh, there's so much money that's injected into the arts. So we've been really fortunate to be able to do shows and make records and, and we, we can enlist the help of all these agencies. And yeah, we're just, we're so lucky to be able to do that. Did uh, hockey energize the Red Mile? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. The Red Mile. Musically even? Yeah, you, you know, anytime I find what's happened is because, you know, once, you know, uh, the Red Mile, there's people, they're having fun. So there's work for musicians playing and, and being able to, to do their thing. And um, yeah, that's the one cool thing about uh, in Alberta, especially not so much in this last year because we've been suffering a little bit because of the oil prices, but it still is a vibrant city in terms of being able to get out and play and, and do these shows. And so that's the good news is that there's there's work there for the working musician, especially uh, if you're if you want to work, you can. You know, if you show up on time, and learn your stuff. <laughs> One other Calgarian has been on the show, Kirby Sewell. Oh yeah, yeah. Kirby. I I, Kirby I from know Kirby. Beaches Jazz. He's, yeah. He played last summer. Yeah, yeah. He's Kirby a talent. He's a talented dude. Yeah, great guy. Yeah. Cool. Well, great to meet you. Great to meet you too. Thank Thanks you for so being much. on the show. Yeah. Troy thank Coco. you so much.